Incorrect Perspectives We must not assume that sincere Christians are always correct in their perspectives simply because they are older and more experienced. Here now is Gene Getz. In our last principle, we actually looked at Eliphaz. And Eliphaz had a real problem in counseling Job because he relied too much on experience. Now, experience is important. Intuition is important. But the most important thing is what God has revealed. And our intuitions and our experience should always be in harmony with what God says. And that's very important when we're counseling somebody who's having a difficult time, who is in crisis. And, of course, Job is certainly certainly in crisis. Now, a second friend comes along, and his name, as we've already seen, is Bildad. And Bildad had a problem in the sense that he put tradition, uh, historical perspectives and traditions above God's revelation. And that led him to uh, say some things that were very hurtful, and very painful to Job as he was trying to counsel him, but he didn't do a very good job. And if you'll notice uh, chapter 8, verse 3, uh, he asked two questions, and they're leading questions in terms of communicating with Job. And so Bildad said, does God pervert justice? Well, answer uh, the answer, of course, is no, that God would never do that. And then he asked the second question, does the Almighty pervert what is right? And of course, uh, the answer to that question would be no. Certainly God would not do that. So there's an implication here that Job is actually perverting justice or accusing God of that and not dealing with reality and with truth in his own life. And so uh, Bildad goes on, Uh, to look to the past, to tradition. And we see that in verse 8. He says, Job, for ask the previous generation and pay attention to what their fathers discovered since we were born only yesterday and we know nothing. And by the way, that is a bit obsequious, I think. And by the way, I just looked up that word again to make sure I was using it correctly. But basically, it means uh, excessive. It's an overstatement. It's uh, hyperbole. And it sounds really humble to say, since we were born only yesterday, we know nothing. And by the way, in saying that, he's making Job feel bad. Because the implication is, Job, who do you think you are? You know, uh, we don't claim to have all the answers to this. You shouldn't either. So he's not taking a very sensitive approach. But he goes on to say, Our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and speak from their understanding? In other words, Job, you really need to listen to the fathers. You need to listen to the previous generations. In essence, Job, you're not very teachable. And those aren't very comforting words to a man who is suffering. And, of course, we know the end of the story. We know the beginning of the story. Job doesn't understand it. They don't understand it. Uh, and we know that, that what uh, this man, Bildad, is sharing with him is, is not true. He's only adding pain uh, to Job's suffering. And so he goes on to say, Such is the destiny of all who forget God. The hope of the godless will perish. Now, notice... This is very important. Eliphaz was correct in his view regarding God's power and justice. No question about that. That was a correct correct observation. But he was dead wrong to suggest that Job had forgotten God and was godless. That was dead wrong. And that implication was such a painful innuendo in relationship to this this communication. So, you see, Bildad and and his older mentors had a false view of God's perspective on Job's personal predicament. It wasn't correct. His comments sounded spiritual. They really did. 
But frankly, they were also arrogant. Sound spiritual, but arrogant. And it's interesting that in the New Testament, when we look at Jesus and His relationship, particularly with the Pharisees, uh, He put His finger right on their problem. Now, I'm not saying that Job's three friends were like the Pharisees in every respect, but in some respects they were. And this is uh, the question that the Pharisees asked. Why don't you, do your disciples, live according to the what? Traditions of the elders. Instead of eating bread with ritually unclean hands. In other words, they're appealing not to the Word of God, but they're appealing to, to, to tradition and putting tradition above, really, the Word of God. And so Jesus really put his finger on their problem. And notice it's a pretty sharp barb. Jesus said to these men, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips. They sound good. They really sound good. That's kind of a reminder, isn't it, in some respects of Job's friends, his counselors. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men, disregarding the command of God. You keep the tradition of men. And so, you see, what basically we have here in this illustration with the Pharisees is that the religious leaders, in many respects, had a correct view of God. They had a correct view of God's power. They had a correct view of God's justice, just as Bildad did and the older generation, but they were wrong in consulting tradition that contradicted certain aspects of biblical truth. So there's a tremendous principle there that we need to think about. And here's the question for reflection and response. How can the average Christian keep from being confused by the teachings and writings of sincere Bible students, particularly those who've done so much to lay the groundwork for our biblical studies today? Now, This, I think, is a very practical question because as all of us look back at church history or even at our mentors, uh, there are a lot of godly people out there. There are a lot of authors. There are a lot of books. There are a lot of teachers. There are a lot of preachers. So, you know, how can we avoid uh, being led astray by people who are sincere? people who really believe the Word of God. And I just simply would say that one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we don't follow the teachings of just one person, including yours truly. We need multiple teachers, multiple counselors, because it's in a multitude of counselors their safety in understanding the Word of God. And as you look at church history and as you look at people today, some of the incredibly false religions that have crept up, and even within the true bounds of evangelical Christianity, there are people that follow one individual. That one individual becomes their primary leader. They're always quoting that one individual. And so they become followers of a man in some respects rather than followers of of the Lord and followers of the book and followers of others who interpret the Scriptures. So we have to be very careful of that. And what we need to do as we research, as we study, as we listen, is to look for harmony among more than just one sincere Bible student. And that can be the older and that can be the younger. I think sometimes we get led astray by new voices. And and we have to be very, very careful of that. And there's a lot of younger individuals that can come on the scene who feel like they have truth beyond uh, their seniors or their older ones, and they just are beginning the learning process themselves. So we have to be very, very careful about that. Recently, I've been researching my own religious history. And I've had the privilege of being in Germany and in Switzerland uh, in the very locations where my great-great-grandfather grew up and my great-grandfather 
uh, on both sides, of my mother's side and my dad's side. And, uh, but the interesting thing is that there was one man that emerged who developed a certain theology within that region. And he did a lot of good and he had a lot of truth. But he also had some error. And that error eventually was transmitted to the United States. It, it came into the, to our culture, into our society. And I happened to grow up in the generations to follow that. And I was exposed to that religious system and to that error, which was based on one basic individual. So we have to be very careful about that. Because out of the Reformation came some very significant voices, such as Luther and John Calvin and Zwingli and others. But they all had their personal opinions on certain aspects of theology and truth. And again, we must be careful that we take into consideration multiple voices of people who understand the Scriptures and who are committed to the Scriptures and who are teachable. And one of the things I've noticed is a lot of times individuals who emerge to develop their own system of thinking and thought, really are resistant to learning from other people as well. And they're not teachable. Even though they have a lot of truth, they don't have their ideas uh, molded and shaped and evaluated by other individuals who love the Lord just like they do. So there's a very important principle here that I think uh, that, that really grows out of this. And by the way, One of the interesting things we should keep in mind is that God has modeled that because He has given us a book authored by who? Matthew? Are we Matthewites? Markites? Lukeites? Johnites? No. We follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke. And and, uh, the Apostle Paul. And Peter. And James. In other words, God has modeled how important it is for us to have multiple voices and to see the unity that's within those voices to give us the security that we need in Jesus Christ, that we are following the truth. And so that applies to us today and to those that we listen to today. So here is the principle to live by. We must not assume that sincere Christians are always correct in their perspectives simply because they're older and more experienced.